Perhaps you've heard the term surround or 3D sound or even ambisonics and wave field synthesis and you never quite put them all together. In this masterclass, what I'm offering is a curated selection of the most significant topics and concepts related to immersive audio. And I hope that that will serve you as a sort of a guideline for your next immersive audio project or venture. Hello. Well, thank you for coming to this masterclass. I would like to spend a few words before we start with the presentation. Uh, when I was asked to do this masterclass, I was a bit worried about the timing uh, because usually these are very complicated uh, topics. And normally I would have like three hours and another three hours of uh, practical demonstrations. The idea is to sort of bring you what I believe to be the most significant topics and concepts related to uh, immersive audio. So you can see this keynote as a sort of a toolkit that hopefully you can use if you decide to step into immersive audio in your next project or venture. The title, I apologize if it is a bit deceiving, we're not really going to go into a historical analysis. I will try to make some historical references to immersive audio from the past. But here the goal is really to sort of build a roadmap to sort of bring everybody on the same page when it comes to immersive audio. Let me introduce you to the five different topics that I've sort of picked for this masterclass. And I thought about, you know, jumping a little bit from topic to topic. So bear with me on this case. But the idea is to sort of facilitate if you're taking notes or if you decide to watch this masterclass afterwards online, to sort of follow very uh, specified uh, concept that I hope you can bring home uh, today. We're going to start by uh, sort of with the most daunting task of defining uh, immersive audio. Then we're going to go on and step into the virtual worlds, which represents sort of the biggest evolution in not only in immersive audio, but in sound technology as a whole. We must s make a stop and talk about ambisonics, which has gained the reputation of an important role nowadays. And then we're going to conclude with uh, immersive audio for physical environments, which is sort of uh, my personal area of expertise, and the art of spatialization, which uh, somehow is a concept is the driving force that is sort of the reason why we are all here pretty much. Defining immersive audio. Why do I think it's important to define immersive audio? You might have heard different concepts around ambisonics, wave field synthesis, binaural, 3D sound, 360 audio, all of that. And immersive audio, I believe, doesn't quite define any specific category. And there's certainly a lot of ways that you can sort of look at immersive audio. You can look at the technological principle, right? You can look at it from an experience principle. Is it an experience? Is it a method? And all of these sort of concepts, I believe, are all part of the big family of immersive audio. So all of these terminologies that you probably have read, you have seen, you might have heard, uh, somehow are all part of the immersive audio family. But you don't actually have to learn all of this. I'm not going to go on a one-hour monologue trying to reiterate definitions or references that maybe you can find uh, yourself online. I'm going to try to simplify and really make an effort to sort of try to agree upon very basic definitions. Because as an industry, we do suffer from a lot of confusion among tech people, creators, and ultimately, consumers when it comes to understanding immersive audio. So it's a really simple exercise, the one that I'm proposing is called the three vector definition exercise. I believe that each of the terms that you saw on the, on the previous slides can be analyzed from three different sort of perspectives. So the technological perspective, so what kind of mathematical principle is behind this specific technology? What's the idea? What's the implementation? What kind of tools, hardware, software are uh, used or describe this technique? 
but you also have the experience sort of vector or definition. Is ambisonics an experience? Is 3D60 audio an experience? Is binaural an experience? Now, we can debate uh, forever whether or not uh, certain things define an immersive experience uh, or a normal experience. But in this case, the idea is to really look at things from a perception standpoint. Okay, so what are the type of medium that are sort of delivering this immersive content to me from a listener perspective? And then you also have the context of application. Where am I most likely to find this technologies, this concept, where I'm going to find surround, where I'm going to find binaural, where I'm going to find ambisonics, so on and so forth. So if you actually take a look of, at all of these definitions, you really have to know four of them. And I took some liberties to sort of tie them together, but there is really only four categories that you should be aware of, uh, because they all belong in the same family. And these four categories start with surround. That's the first category of sort of concepts, both technical, experiential, and of application that you need to consider. You're probably familiar with this term. You immediately perhaps are thinking about cinema experience and sort of movies and soundtracks. And that's, as I said, defining one way of surround sound, which is the context of application. But if you actually start putting pieces together, you realize that quadraphonic sound is part of this family as well. They share the same sort of characteristics, the same sort of features, the same sort of workflow, and we're going to touch on that uh, later on. The second category that you need to know is binaural. And it is quite tricky nowadays because, as we will see, as we step into virtual worlds, there are a lot of misuse of these terminologies. We define binaural what is really a 360 audio experience. We define with 3D sound what is really a surround experience. Binaural pretty much is the result of a long-lasting legacy of binaural recording. And you might have seen the famous dummy head the sort of like little head with two ears and microphone. I have a, let's say, a modern version here today. The idea is sort of to match as close as possible the type of auditory system that we have in recording sound. And the context of application, obviously, you might have heard about binaural beats. You might have heard about the whole ASMR community online. There's a bunch of people uploading content and sort of with ticklish sound really close to one year and another. So these are some of the examples of binaural. The third category and the fourth category, which are sort of separated brothers or sisters in this case, are 360 audio and 3D sound. Now, as I said, I took some liberties to uh, sort of define these categories, but I think it's quite accurate. And I think it would be good for the whole the communities involved to sort of agree uh, on this concept. So 360 audio really, I believe, belongs in a more virtual-oriented application of spatial audio. So all of the different VR um, or mixed realities applications, uh, it might uh, involve a specific uh, workflow um, and pretty much is, has to do with context of application like 360 videos as well. But on the other side, 3D sound perhaps refers more to physical environments. So a bunch of loudspeakers, real spaces, uh, professional uh, audio systems. And it's more of a social experience rather than an individual experience like 360 audio and binaural. So with these four categories, you can sort of fit all the different terminologies uh, in these four big branches of immersive audio. So all of these four are part of the immersive audio family. And if you sort of look at them as a whole and sort of apply the three vector definition model that I was talking before, you start placing certain terminologies and certain labels exactly where they belong. Okay, so if we were to look at surround and we look at the sort of technological 
vector of describing the concept behind it. We find all the different specifications, 5.1, 7.1, 10.2, even a smart speakers. It usually refers to a two horizontal, two-dimensional sort of uh, workflow and processing. And if we look at the type of experience that surround sound sort of delivers, perhaps it, it has more to do with a sense of diffusion, envelopment, or enhanced sort of uh, attempt to replicate reality. Now, remember that surround sound wasn't really created to offer a more immersive music experience, but it was created to offer a more immersive experience for the movies. And here comes one of the first historical references. You can go check it out, the famous uh, Fanta sound for the movie Fantasia from Walt Disney. That not only is the first movie that used stereophonic, pretty much, uh, technology, but other releases of the same movies implemented surround sound up to, I believe, six loudspeakers, or rather six channels of diffusion. Obviously, context of application of a surround, cinemas, quadraphonic concert, I took the liberty to include acousmatic music as well, uh, sound bars, sort of the consumer uh, market. And again, we don't have the time here to sort of describe each one of these terminologies, but the important thing to me is that if you decide to investigate on your own, you know exactly in what type of field you should, you should place that terminology. Then if we look at binaural. Then Technology terms related to binaural. Well, I mean, obviously binaural recordings, obviously HRTFs, you might have heard of that uh, term, which are sort of the type of filters that our auditory system use when perceiving sound coming from different directions. They're sort of uh, model filters based on the type of uh, shape of our head. Um, the dummy head or binaural microphone, as we said, and usually it involves uh, a non-real-time processing, pretty much you either record and you listen to what you're recording or you're already sort of mixing and you're just hearing a playback. So the type of experience can be both virtual or real. What I mean by real is if I were to speak into this microphone and you were listening on a headphones, you hear exactly what I'm, what I'm doing. But there are also tools for virtual binaural sort of rendering. It is sort of tied with a concept of using headphones. You can see how things can get quite blurry with one another because when we see headphones and we immediately think binaural, well, perhaps not all the cases it's binaural. You have certain headphones out there in the market that sort of sell the idea of being a binaural headphone, but there's no really uh, any type of content that is conceived to be binaural in the first place uh, to go along with it. And type of context, binaural music, ASMR, and, and binaural beats. If we go to what I call 360 audio, so all the stuff related to ambisonics, it includes a very specific, perhaps, workflow. Uh, it includes head tracking. It includes a bunch of uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional sort of processing in real time. So those are the features that allow you to sort of wear a headset and you sort of have a three-dimensional soundscape that reacts whenever you move your head up and down, left and right. It's a mainly virtual experience. It requires, I would say, headphones. So in a way, it gets close to, to a binaural experience, but in fact, it's quite different. And type of applications, again, mixed reality, virtual reality, video games, and even social media platforms. You might have heard of Facebook 360 and YouTube 360. Then, 3D sound has to do perhaps with more physical environment. Here is where you sort of perhaps have heard or read all the crazy, geeky words like distance-based amplitude panning, wave field synthesis, and higher order ambisonics, and all, that, uh, all of those uh, things. And it usually involves a three-dimensional spatial processing in real time, meaning that you need an actual technology to, to make it work. Usually it's found in physical environments. Uh, you might have seen places with a bunch of loudspeakers. There are speakers placed all over the three-dimensional uh, axis. And the idea is really to deliver as much as a more enveloping experience, a more real experience when trying to match 
position, for example, of musicians on stage. So I'm actually hearing exactly what I see. But there's also an uh, application where you don't want to have that sort of correlation with the visual uh, components. So that's where you start, you start exploring the illusion of instruments or sounds coming from, from different parts uh, of the space. Context of application, there are a, a bunch of Pro Audio Immersive system now uh, out there. Obviously, a lot of speakers, manufacturers are happy about immersive audio because they can sell more speakers, so they're all over it. You can find also this type of applications in sound installation or artistic sort of avant-garde music, but 3D sound is sort of, I would say, a natural evolution of surround in a way. So, you can see how things get tricky between 360 audio, 3D sound, and binaural, and how things can be sort of easily confused because you use or adopt a certain workflow that belongs to a 360 audio workflow, but you're really then listening with headphones, and then you see perhaps the same type of content being delivered in a physical environment. And all of this sort of happened when we sort of moved away from a certain workflow, and as an industry adopted a more, let's say, agnostic approach or philosophy. Pretty much what happened in the past, I would say, couple of decades, but really in the last decade, uh, sort of when digital uh, uh, audio sort of uh, progressed in a, in a major way, um, we sort of tried to separate, or rather decouple, uh, the content creation production, editing process from the content fruition and consumption stage as a technological sort of framework. We tried to separate those two because before, in this example of a traditional music production chain, you have a bunch of audio tracks, you sort of go into a studio, give them to an engineer that sort of mix them down into a stream of two audio channels. The idea of sort of matching the format of production with the format of listening, okay? So, I have two channels, goes to two speakers. If I have six speakers, like a 5.1 surround system, there's a feed that goes to six speakers, okay? Um, now, stereo doesn't require a lot of bandwidth, easy to use, I just need two speakers. Easy to produce on, I just need two speakers in the studio, works great with headphones, boom. That's how you build an industry standard. But as sort of the evolution of different formats and listening formats has progressed, this workflow became quite inefficient in a way. And for example, when you were going to perhaps prepare a content for a movie in 5.1, and then you wanted to also make the same content available for a 7.1 format, let alone a virtual reality experience, you sort of had to always go back and redo the whole preparation, content, mixing, and processing from zero. Because you were tied, the two processes were tied to one another. So that became quite an inefficient way of working, especially with the rise of new multi-channel formats. And I would say that spatial audio sort of was the driving force of these needs as the spatial sort of component, uh, you know, required more channels, an extensive multi-channel workflow, and so on. And so we moved from this workflow to a more abstract workflow that is commonly known as object-based workflow, meaning instead of treating audio tracks as audio tracks, you're actually treating audio tracks as objects, okay? And these objects can have different attributes, all right? And specifically in this case, we are focusing on the spatial attributes of these objects. The idea here is not this fancy animation here, but the idea is to separate this sort of encoding process from the decoding process. Meaning, I can prepare content in a way, bringing in all the information that I want, in this case, spatial information, and then I don't even care what type of device the final user is using to reproduce that content. 
you know, certain devices do the dirty work of sort of figuring out what kind of information I can use to match the type of output that I need. So if I need an output for a 5.1, I just need, I bring this much information. If I am in a full-blown uh, cinema experience, I bring some other information. If I need to reproduce it over headphones, I pick some other information. But as a content creator, engineer, editor, and whatever, you don't have to go back and sort of redo this process every time for each, uh, for each format. Now, I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that we are that close to this scenario, but that's sort of where the industry is going. And especially if you are a creator or an artist, this is perhaps the single most important notion to take into account when approaching a project with immersive audio. What kind of workflow are we actually using? Am I have to mix in a channel-based uh, manner, or am I working with sound objects? And perhaps there's no technology or, let's say, uh, framework that embodies this sort of concept than, than Ambisonics. Now, I'm not going to pretend to explain to you Ambisonics in just five minutes, obviously, but it has become such a big player nowadays that uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't avoid to, to include it uh, in, this, in this masterclass. And why is Ambisonic now becoming such, such an important tool to understand, specifically as we've seen in 360 audio applications. Ambisonics, well, two reasons. First of all, it's free from content, from patents and, and trademarks, and that's a big, big, big deal. So pretty much it's free to use for everybody. Nobody can really monetize on the technology. And second of all, it sort of has a unique position because it can cover pretty much the entire spectrum of the audio chain, from recording to processing to delivery, whether that delivery is virtual or physical. Recording because, yes, there are Ambisonics microphones nowadays. So you can sort of already step into that world from the recording process. And then you have a bunch of tools and uh, free tools that you can find online to sort of elaborate the uh, spatial sort of uh, attributes of objects with a bunch of software tools that, that you can find uh, online. And then the delivery stage, because Ambisonics can sort of work both in a virtual environment, as we've seen 360 audio, or uh, in this case, making a binaural reduction of that, of that environment. And it can also work in physical environments with real loudspeakers uh, array. So just to put it in the most simple way I can possibly put it uh, in terms of ambisonics and how it works, once again, it starts from a long-lasting legacy of multi-channel or rather, multi-microphone recording techniques, okay? And the idea is to represent the space around the listener as a sort of a perfect sphere of sound, okay? So the concept of related to ambisonics is really about a spherical domain of operation. And this sort of perfect, virtual, almost utopistic sphere of sound, I can use to record, but also to reproduce sound as a sort of a virtual uh, loudspeaker array. And the type, of, the type of characteristics that Ambisonics offer is the ability to sort of divide this ideal sphere in little pieces, little areas of, of interaction. These are called spherical harmonics, to use a fancy, another fancy word. And what these harmonics sort of describe are like the pixels on a picture, right? So the higher the pixel ratio you have, the higher the quality you have, the higher the accuracy or resolution of the spatial soundscape that you have. So as you can imagine, the more I go up with this sort of use of spherical harmonics, I am increasing what are called the orders of ambisonics. So you have first order, second order, third order, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eleventh, whatever. To give you a reference, nowadays, especially for, let's say, consumer-oriented platforms like 360 videos and stuff like that, we're using just first and second order ambisonics, okay? So we're really still down to a very basic and poor spatial experience. I believe Facebook 360 uses uh, second order ambisonics. So there is a tendency to sort of 
extend that capability as bandwidth would would be more more you know capable and and also real time processing online will be able to hold that processing so pretty much the experience is down to a front back left right up down and omnidirectional sort of pixels that i can use to replicate a virtual soundscape as far as a physical delivery here's where it get quite uh, interesting in terms of uh, ambisonic uh, use we, we sort of step in into the, the physical environments the idea is that if I were to use ambisonics and I'm still part of this sort of spherical domain, I must somehow replicate a perfectly spherical loudspeaker array to be coherent with this sort of process. So now you can see how sort of ambisonics works perfectly with headphones in a way, because it's a perfectly controlled environment that doesn't really exist physically. So it's quite easier to sort of translate a virtual sphere into a binaural sort of virtual rendering. But when it comes to physical environments, as I said, here's where Ambisonic sort of shows his dark side in a way. As you can imagine, implementing a perfectly spherical uh, loudspeaker array is not ideal or practical. But also, because of the principle, the mathematical principle of Ambisonics, if you actually put a bunch of speakers in a perfectly spherical array in a room, you're going to create quite a small optimal listening area called the sweet spot in the center. So if you're not actually in the center, you will sort of lose most of the spatial sort of coordinates and perception that were originally uh, conceived for that, that performance. And here is where you kind of explore different formats. Uh, I, I could be talking about, for example, the wave field synthesis approach, which you might have seen, or if you haven't, good for you. You, haven't, you, have, you can still sleep at night. The idea with physical environments is that there's sort of a lot of, it's still a quite an unexplored area of, of immersive audio because it kind of moves away from the perfect virtual environment that we talked about, but in a way is actually going back to the original thinking of creating immersive audio experiences with sound. If you think, here comes another historical references uh, about the Philips Pavilion, for example, one of the first attempts to sort of create these type of experiences were to put a bunch of loudspeakers specifically placed in a specifically designed building that would sort of create the illusion of moving sound throughout the space. And back then in the 50s, they were, they were doing that with a bunch of relay uh, controllers sort of turning on and off different speakers, sort of creating the illusion of sound movement. And in a way, 3D sound is the attempt to sort of make that type of concept relevant with today's capabilities and today's tools. Here are some pictures of some of the stuff that we've done. Obviously, you're working with high-density loudspeaker arrays, meaning there's a bunch of channels that you need to deal with. But obviously, you also have the physical sort of room, the proper acoustic of the physical space that you are in. The challenge here, for example, where wave field synthesis also sort of failed to deliver uh, in a way, one can make the argument that they failed to deliver, is that you actually need quite a flexible mathematical principle to be able to adapt and adjust to the different spaces. All these spaces are all different. The idea is, especially the work that we've done uh, at Intorno, was to sort of find uh, a principle that would allow us to actually maintain a virtual representation of sound in space across all three dimensions, no matter the layout or configuration of the loudspeakers. So sort of embracing the idea of an object-based workflow entirely and disconnecting completely the type of format, the idea of surround sound format like 5.1, 7.1, from the actual implementation. So pretty much as you use certain tools to sort of perform spatial audio, you can forget about what kind of system is actually implemented. If it is 32.4 uh, or if it is a 49.6, it doesn't really matter. Now, 
It is important to also to note that um, uh, in physical environments, uh, there is a sort of, I would say, more aesthetic debate going on in, in terms of immersive audio applications, which is what actually defines an immersive audio application. Uh, if I'm listening, if I'm in a beautiful venue and I'm listening to uh, an acoustic performance and perhaps the musicians are placed in different areas of the room, is that an immersive experience? Hmm. Interesting. And what if I'm actually placing a bunch of loudspeakers around the room, they're just blasting, for example, my voice. Let's imagine that we place a bunch of these loudspeakers around here, and you can all hear my voice coming from all direction. Is that an immersive experience with sound? Hmm, interesting. Well, here comes our last hero, which is sound specialization. If you notice, in all the different topics that I've covered, I've never once mentioned spatial audio as a sort of category or technical principle. And that's because I believe in this sort of conception that I'm offering you today of those four categories. Specialization is actually more an act rather than a concept. It's the act of manipulating sound in space with whatever tool that we have available. So in a way, even if we're doing surround, even if we're doing binaural, even if we're doing 360 audio, even if we're doing 3D sound, we're all performing spatial audio in a way. It's an intrinsic sort of act if you're actually using the technological opportunity that you have. And why is it called the art of specialization? The idea is, well, there are different uses of immersive audio, as I said. can be to just create a more sense of envelopment, a better sense of diffusion of sound, can be used to give a more realistic experience, right? It would be much better if, as I move around this stage, the voice from my microphone would follow me, right? Would be a much realistic feel. Well, you need to sort of perform some specialization to achieve that, right? But as I said, also, Specialization opens the door, and this is really what is, what is all about in, in, in today's application, is to actually see if there is a new creative frontier to be discovered in that sense. Can spatial audio actually unlock a new form of performance or creativity when it comes to, to music? And so immersive audio and spatial audio are two different things. One, as we said, describes an entire family of concepts, of technologies, of experiences, and again, the four categories that I've, that I've shown you. Well, specialization sort of is a transversal force. It's always present in a way or another uh, in all of this context. And I call it the art of specialization because as I worked with a lot of different artists uh, especially in the past three years, uh, the idea is that you can create quite interesting sort of effects, quite interesting soundscapes with uh, specialization. But the challenge here has nothing to do with the type of technologies that we talked about before. It's a completely disconnected sort of environment, in a way. You can use and create a bunch of specialization tools that can somehow interface, uh, interface themselves with either ambisonics or 360 audio or uh, 3D sound or binaural. So really here is more a battle of user experience and user design experience. What kind of tools can we actually create to facilitate the job of creators and artists in this direction? And now you can see why sort of the 3D sound let's say, environment, is a bit more suitable for this type of, for this type of operation. And also, why the object-based workflow that we've seen before is more suitable for this type of uh, sort of philosophy. The idea is that as a creator, as an artist, I, I can sort of detach myself 
from physical environments and sort of compose and create in an ideal abstract dimension where I can sort of draw and design different properties or different sounds and different moments, different sort of sound environments. And the challenge as, a, as an industry, as the uh, technical sort of representative here today of the industry, is that we should be able to find a common ground to sort of make sure that whatever the artist is creating is maintained as much as possible. It's called the artistic coherence throughout formats. As much as possible, whether or not we're reproducing it with headphones or with sound or with 70 speakers or uh, in a virtual reality uh, headset. But I do feel uh, like a good first step would be to agree upon the different definitions, all right? It could be a good exercise if the tech community, the artistic community, and the sort of audience uh, can sort of talk the same language and, and, and sort of agree upon what I believe to be the most fundamental elements of, of spatial audio. So going back to this board right here, I hope that you sort of were able to have a more sort of comprehensive understanding of where each of these terminology belong in this sort of crazy immersive audio environment that we live in today. And the next time perhaps that you're gonna face an immersive audio idea project or discussing something like this, you, I hope that you will be able to ask more questions, more right questions. And in a way we can sort of work together in a better way. I'm always asked a bunch of times, hey Ludo, why, uh, th this thing that you're doing, is it with Ambisonics? And I find myself explaining more of the differences between the concept than actually explaining what we're actually doing. Uh, and so I feel like this could be a good starting point if you decide to explore this world. And, um, and I think that's pretty much, yeah, if you have <laughs> questions. Hi, thank Hi. you. What's your recommendation for the best tool uh, for specialization of audio? Ooh. Ooh. Well, I have an evident conflict of interest <laughs> as, a, as a founder of a, of a company that designs these tools. Well, let me say this. As of right now, I would be more concerned about what kind of context of application you're really looking at, because that will be a much more determining factor in the tools that you're going to use than to just sort of compare the different tools like in a vacuum by themselves. Uh, I can perhaps suggest to you a certain tool that to me is very clever, very well designed, but if it doesn't offer the sort of compatibility with the type of content that you need to produce, then, then it's, it's, quite, it's quite useless. I would say that we're really doing quite a poor job nowadays of designing uh, interesting tools for specialization. Uh, there is a sort of a discrepancy between the amount of renders that are out there. So sort of this does Ambisonics and this other plugin does Ambisonics plus binaural. This does Ambisonics binaural 7.1, whatever. But as, as, as tools to sort of actually create uh, and to actually operate spatial audio, uh, we're actually doing quite a poor job. Um, there are a, a couple of, of plugins, maybe later on I can, I, can, I, can, I can tell you about, that if you perhaps are into virtual reality, uh, those are a bit more advanced. It seems to me that uh, spatial audio, when applied to those contexts, is uh, sort of benefiting from perhaps better companies or better designers that sort of work in those environments. And I'm not trying to avoid the question, but it's, it's really, um, for example, if you were to prepare a, a, a 3D sound performance, live performance uh, with us, um, uh, any of those tools would be quite, quite useless and quite actually limited uh, for the type of opportunity that you have. So when we're working with immersive audio, mm -hmm. uh, is there any tool so you can use 3D in, mm -hmm. in a way? I mean, because normally we are dealing with 2D interfaces to, yes. to place that. Is there now tools for that? Yes, there are. Um, 
there are. Uh, there is, uh, uh, I think, a couple of companies that are now exploring this sort of uh, sort of virtual reality sort of uh, uh, controllers. So you can sort of draw into a virtual space uh, where the sounds are. I would say, well, first going back to the two-dimensional sort of screen or whatever that we're using, uh, it's just whatever, we have to deal with it. I'm not sure that type of three-dimensional uh, visual feedback uh, for spatial audio tools is, um, is as much as a sort of professional tool as it is more a consumer-oriented uh, application. Uh, I honestly doubt that, um, that an engineer in the future will be sitting in the studio sort of <laughs> drawing and, and, and mixing stuff with, with, with that sort of feedback. There will be for sure attempts to do that, um, but uh, immersive audio is complex enough uh, so that actually uh, the more we can sort of mask the technological uh, difficulties uh, in designing tools, uh, I think the better it is. I mean, if I'm doing immersive audio, I don't want to be having to learn a new tool in order to then create immersive audio. Uh, I would just want to have the most uh, natural extension of, of, of the way we operate with computers in this case to achieve that. And there is now, what, like 40 years of legacy of operating in front of a screen uh, with a trackpad or, or a mouse controller. So unfortunately, it's just so far ahead, that type of behavior that um, they will be really hard uh, to, to, sort of, to sort of change that. Uh, it will really have to be something so, so easy to use that will probably mean that we will be all sort of walking around uh, with those type of tools that help us in everyday life, not just uh, immersive audio. And that's, and that's also one of the things about uh, VR, um, which... Uh, uh, nowadays is sort of attached to the to be one of the main application of immersive audio uh, and, or video games for that matter. Um, I would say that uh, that before we get to a quite extensive, I mean that will only happen if VR will take over the entire or a good chunk of the consumer behavior and and, and entertainment. And I mean. I'm assuming we're all pretty much people involved in creative industries here. If you ask around, how many hours have you spent the last weekend w with VR? Maybe someone has spent an hour or 10 minutes or tried. I would say we're quite far away because that will really mean that to achieve that level of sophistication in the technology, VR should be something that, hey, what have you done yesterday? Well, I spent like five hours, uh, you know, uh, playing around with, with virtual reality headset. We're not there yet. So, uh, yeah. Ludo, one question. Uh, when you approach one of your projects, which are the most challenging issues? Uh, creative, technical, physical restrictions? Good question. Um, well, a first, an entire first part of our job is dealing with all the boring technical uh, challenges. Uh, Obviously, you're presented with a space like this, so we start analyzing, okay, what are the dimension, height, reverberation time, all those sort of things. Um, and then we proceed uh, into actually designing what best system would fit this type of, uh, this type of environment that is also consequential of a bunch of different things, you know, budgets, uh, production capabilities, and stuff like that. Uh, if you in an ideal world with endless money, you would probably fill all of this room with one speaker next to another. <laughs> uh, that's quite unpractical. So that's why you need a sort of a new framework that is the one that we are uh, proposing. And after you've done with all that, uh, then you sort of start working on the spatialization of sound. That is sort of the bridge that connects immersive audio with the content, in a way. Um, and that's the, the work that you do with the artist, and that's the work that you sort of uh, do by creating and designing tools that serve that purpose. Uh, an artist doesn't really care uh, if you're using uh, uh, 
uh, ambisonics of fifth order or third order, probably even know uh, what it is. And, and there are artists that obviously want to dig in deeper into the technicalities of the things, and there's, uh, there's months to be talked about uh, in that regard. Uh, but uh, what an artist uh, really is focused on is what kind of tools can I have to sort of interface my art or my setup for this specific uh, environment. Uh, and as you see, you're going to have a lot of different profiles, right? If a DJ comes in, has a completely different workflow than a composer that has a completely different workflow than a live electronic uh, musician. Uh, so every sort of category of artistic profile, in theory, should require a tool de you know, designed to facilitate that workflow. And so that's why I would say, uh, well, in our case, we're trying to fill as much as possible the field of uh, application and tools. But, and going back to, the, to that question, um, that's why nowadays there's still not quite one tool that sort of can function universally uh, for, for all the different uh, formats. I would also like to mention, uh, I think it's worth mentioning, the project uh, Orpheus. It's a European initiative that is sort of bringing together all the major players in uh, immersive audio to sort of try to agree upon what I was showing you before, the spatial metadata that should be included in audio distribution and audio broadcast. So assuming we, we're going to we're going to reach a day where we can all agree upon what kind of attributes and spatial attributes should exist universally for everybody, then you will start probably seeing tools being designed that have more than, than one use. From that side, nobody. <laughs> all right. There. Yeah, you're sort of sitting right in the middle, so the it middle. doesn't really <laughs> count. Since in the beginning, one of the aims of the music reproduction has been to convey the emotion of music. Uh, Will the immersive audio convey this emotion too? I mean, is one of the characteristics or is just uh, another one? Well, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, um, it's an interesting debate. It's an open debate. I, will, I can bring to you what is known for certain, which is that okay. we can't quite uh, pay attention to more than four or five um, Acoustic cues, uh, sort of be not behaving, but uh, I would say being active at the same time. I mean, obviously, as humans, we walk down the street, we perceive sounds from all over the place, but you can't quite pay attention to where five cars are going at the same time. You can't quite focus on, 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 on that. Um, so that determines uh, an interesting uh, uh, study that has been conducted that says that as the more sort of the um, spatial audio component is predominant uh, in, in, in a music context, there's actually a curve where the higher the complexity, the better sort of the intelligibility and information you get. But there is like a, there's like a slope that goes down into the how much you actually perceive to like music when it's a, it's a very dense and high degree of spatial information. And that's an interesting area of, of exploration. And as I said, it goes also back to the idea of what really is immersive. Uh, you are, I don't know, you're flying to Cordoba, you're listening to a flamenco uh, performance, drinking some wine in a nice sort of old uh, church. That's immersive in a way. Uh, so can we actually prove that there is uh, an incremental uh, liking of, of, of music and uh, performed in this type of uh, environment. Uh, I would say that in certain cases, um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite obvious. Now, I could be talking six hours, but in the end, it will take you five seconds to really uh, maybe hear A and B, sort of a comparison between an immersive system and a traditional system. Uh, but again, perhaps if you are doing an orchestra, uh, uh, perhaps you can use immersive audio to sort of enhance the visual correlation that the orchestra already provides, for example. So if you have the violins over here, well, I would like to hear the violins coming from over there. If the, you have uh, drums over there, you, you might want to be, you might appreciate more a performance if you have a more natu natural feeling uh, with sound and visual environment. But 
uh, in other cases, especially with modern uh, live electronic music and stuff like that, and, and even pop music, uh, I mean, pe people don't really know. If I were performing here, people don't really know what I'm actually doing. I, this could be one or 300 instruments at the same time. You don't actually have that, that correlation. So knowing that, I can actually play with the illusion that instruments that are coming from over here are actually coming from different parts uh, of the room. For example, there's a bunch of uh, uh, what is considered to be immersive audiovisual experience, the projecting domes, um, that visually are stunning, and I get why they're considered immersive, but sound-wise, uh, I mean, to me, it's, it's quite an interesting question to say, are we really making music for people laying on the floor? This is also immersive. What, uh, what do you expect about the immersive audio in a cars? Interesting. Um, we did actually uh, make a project uh, in a car before, so I won't mention and I won't make any reference, but um, there have been attempts uh, of sort of delivering uh, a more immersive experience in a car. Uh, now, are we in the sort of surround domain, sort of creating a better sense of envelopment or diffusion in a car so you can place more speakers and, 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 and sort of have a better, a better experience? Uh, but again, it has to go along with the type of content that you're playing uh, or reproducing in that system. So the idea is what does immersive audio really mean if you don't bring in sound specialization, meaning a treatment of the content that would take advantage of that platform. So uh, a stereo mix on, that goes on the radio, uh, can that be considered uh, an immersive sound experience in a car? Ooh, it's, uh, it's a tough call. Um, but I would say that there are perhaps other uh, parameters uh, with which you can play with a sense of sound environment in a car, meaning the sound of the car itself, right? You know, different sort of uh, sonic cues that you can use. So when you actually want to turn right, the sound of turning right comes from the right side or the left side. Or if you're changing certain parameters of the car, there's certain sonic feedback in a more sort of uh, I would say, coherent way where, where things actually are. Uh, I, I believe there is something to be explored uh, in that regard. But as far as music, um, as I said, uh, unfortunately, there is content and technological platform that need to go together. Um, and I hope that even with this initiative, so we're sort of agreeing upon a more uh, a more, um, let's say, complex uh, audio distribution infrastructure where you have, uh, instead of having a stereo file, you have a, 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 a certain content encoded with certain parameters, and then you can probably have an immersive system in a car that sort of reads this parameter and reproduce that, that for you. I wouldn't just focus on the, s of the music application in the car. I think there's, uh, there's something to be done with sound in cars regardless. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.